This is the most familiar member of the Stegosauria, a group of dinosaurs that were characterized by a series of bony plates and spines extending along their backs. Although this group existed from the Middle Jurassic period through to the Late Cretaceous period, Stegosaurus is found only in the Late Jurassic rocks of Western North America. It is a large, slow-moving plant-eating dinosaur that lived among, and probably fell prey to, other famous North American dinosaurs of that time, such as Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. Although large, the plates were relatively thin and blunt and would have offered little protection against an attack by one of the large meat-eating theropods. The heavy structure of its legs, its strange curved back and the sheer size of Stegosaurus all suggest that it was not an animal capable of a quick getaway when under attack. As a result, its only defense against fierce Jurassic predators might have been to swing its powerful tail from side to side so that the spikes could be aimed at the delicate legs and belly regions of marauding carnivores. The plates of Stegosaurus might have been used for warning off predators or for recognition between members of a species. But one interesting suggestion is that they functioned as a device for controlling body temperature. Tiny grooves along the plate surfaces indicate the possible presence of numerous blood vessels. These could have served to absorb or discharge body heat. If this were the case, Stegosaurus could probably have controlled the amount of blood passed into the plates to avoid heating up or cooling down at the wrong times. A large dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period in North America, Ankylosaurus was covered from head to tail in sheets of thick bony armor. Large triangular horns projected from the back of its skull. And all along its body, the armor plates were embedded in the skin, with sharp spines sticking up along back and tail. Its tail was thickened at the end into a heavy, bony club. As it shared its habitat with fearsome predators such as Tyrannosaurus and Albertosaurus, it probably needed all this heavy armor. The thick bony plates would have been a good defense against even the most determined theropod. But its underside was unarmored, so, when attacked, Ankylosaurus probably crouched down to protect this vulnerable region. It might have been in danger if a predator could flip it over. But as Ankylosaurus weighed several tons, this would have been difficult to do. Theropods preying upon Ankylosaurus were tall, heavy two-legged animals. As a result, they were slightly less stable than a short four-legged dinosaur. Because of the weight of their bodies, a simple fall could cause them to break some of their bones, especially their slender leg bones. A well-timed blow from the Ankylosaurus tail club could have knocked a predator over or broken one of its legs, resulting in serious injury or even death. Ankylosaurus is one of only two members of the family Ankylosauridae known from North America. All other Ankylosaurids lived in Eastern Asia. It appears that the group first evolved in Asia, at some time in the earliest Cretaceous period, when Eastern Asia and North America were connected by a land bridge. The ancestors of Ankylosaurus probably crossed into North America from Asia using this route. Pachycephalosaurus was a plant-eating dinosaur that roamed Western North America in the late Cretaceous period. It is notable for the huge dome on top of its head that was up to 10 inches, 25 centimeters, thick. The function of this dome is uncertain, and has been the subject of considerable argument among experts ever since the first remains of the dinosaur were discovered in 1940. The dome might have acted like a dinosaur crash helmet to shield the head during attack. But, unlike armored dinosaurs such as Ankylosaurs, the rest of the body is not protected. So protecting only the head would be of little use against the jaws of Tyrannosaurus or other meat-eating dinosaur. Another theory is that the dome might have enabled Pachycephalosaurus to recognize one another. Each species of Pachycephalosaurus had a differently shaped dome. Yet another possibility is that the chief use of the dome was as a weapon against predators and in fights with other Pachycephalosaurus. If two males rammed into each other at high speed, shockwaves caused by a head but could be carried through the skull, down the specially strengthened backbone and through the hind limbs to the ground. However, some experts argue that Pachycephalosaurus would not have butted their heads together, because the bone forming the dome does not itself appear to be very strong. Instead, they suggest, two males might have pushed direct combat is not the only kind of confrontation, some Pachycephalosaurs had spikes projecting down and back behind the head. When the head was lowered, the spikes might have presented a large, formidable display to a rival much as moose antlers do. Existing alongside Pachycephalosaurus were the stout, heavily armored ankylosaurs and the trumpet-headed Parasaurolophus. All of these plant-eating dinosaurs probably fell prey to the giant meat-eaters of the time such as Albertosaurus and Tyrannosaurus rex.
The remains of Protoceratops were discovered in Mongolia's desert, the Gobi, by an expedition from the American Museum of Natural History in New York during the 1920s. It is one of the earliest known members of the group that contains the horned dinosaurs, such as Triceratops. The name Protoceratops is rather misleading, as it has no real horns on its skull merely low bumps of bone on the top of its nose and on its cheeks. But the bony neck frill and parrot-like beak show that it belonged to the same group as the other horned dinosaurs. Protoceratops is more primitive than the other much bigger horned dinosaurs. Its body was barrel-shaped and probably looked a little like that of a large pig. However, unlike a pig, the body was strongly arched at the hips. Because of this, the long, deep tail might have drooped downward from the rear of its body. The hind limbs were strong and straight, with large feet. One reconstruction suggested that the front limbs were sprawled out to the sides, rather like a modern reptile, giving Protoceratops a crouched appearance. But most evidence now indicates that the front limbs were held under the body just like the hind limbs. This arrangement would have supported the head well above ground level. Scientists have discovered the skeletons of baby, juvenile and adult Protoceratops, enabling them to work out the details of their growth. As young Protoceratops grew, their faces became deeper and shorter, their mouths wider, and their bony neck frills wider and taller. The wide rib cage housed a big stomach that was used to digest large amounts of plant food. Because of its slight resemblance to pigs, some scientists have suggested that Protoceratops might have lived a little like them by rooting and grubbing around in the soil for roots, tubers and other nutritious plants. It, it might have behaved like this, but its impressive set of grinding teeth and its parrot-like beak indicate that it could probably chop up much tougher foodstuffs than pigs do. The powerful, stocky build and strong beak of Protoceratops made it a formidable defender of its eggs and young. One remarkable fossil shows the preserved remains of a Protoceratops and a Velociraptor, a theropod dinosaur, entangled together. It appears that these two dinosaurs died in combat as they were overcome by slumping sand dunes. Many eggs and nests first thought to belong to Protoceratops have been unearthed in Mongolia. But most of these nests are now known to have belonged to the theropod Oviraptor. This was the largest and in some ways the most unusual, of the magnificent horned dinosaurs of the late Cretaceous period. No complete skeletons of Triceratops have ever been unearthed. However, the discovery of numerous skulls, horns, and teeth indicate that it was one of the most common dinosaurs of this time. The skull of Triceratops had three prominent horns one short horn on the nose and two long horns above the eyes. Its impressive bony neck frill could reach up to 6 feet 6 inches, 2 meters, in width, extending outward from the back of the skull, covering the neck. The snout formed a curved, parrot-like beak that was tipped with a horn. This imposing head was as much as 5 feet, 1.5 meters, across one of the largest skulls known in any land animal. Long ago, it was proposed that the frill protected the neck of Triceratops against the attacks of big meat-eating dinosaurs such as Tyrannosaurus rex. This might have been true some of the time, but a number of frills have been found with Tyrannosaurus bite marks puncturing them. Another idea is that the frill might have been used for display during contests for mates, territory, or social position within the group. It is likely, as with other Ceratopsians, the frill allowed members of the same species to recognize each other. Another intriguing idea is that the frill was used to regulate body temperature. Triceratops had a stout, barrel-shaped body and powerful limbs that were much more strongly built than those of living elephants. The limbs were probably this strong to withstand the weight of the animal as it ran. But its large size probably meant Triceratops could not run very fast. In addition, the front limbs needed to be very strong to help support the weight of that enormous head. Triceratops looks a little like the dinosaur equivalent of a rhinoceros. It might have behaved in quite a similar way, spending most of its time eating plants and occasionally defending itself with its horns when threatened. The jaws of Triceratops were lined with dozens of closely packed teeth that formed dental batteries similar to those of the duck-billed dinosaurs. The jaws had a powerful scissor-like action, and the rows of teeth formed elongated, cutting blades that were ideal for shredding tough plants into short pieces. Hypsilophodon was one of the smallest dinosaurs, reaching only six and a half feet, two meters, in length when fully grown. It was a slender plant eater whose head was no bigger than a child's hand. Its jaws were lined with a set of ridged, leaf-shaped teeth that were used for slicing through leaves and other parts of plants. In addition to a set of good cutting teeth, Hypsilophodon also had a turtle-like beak, made of horn, at the front of its snout. 
This was useful in nipping the shoots and leaves off juicy plants. Most reptiles lack cheeks, but Hypsilophodon like most other ornithischians might have had fleshy cheeks that helped to keep food in its mouth while chewing. Large holes at the back of the skull provided plenty of room for the attachment of powerful muscles that worked the jaws. The leg bones of Hypsilophodon were long, slender and lightweight. Its long hind legs had big thigh muscles, which helped it to run and dodge speedily. These muscles might have made its legs look a bit like smaller versions of the legs of some of the big flightless birds alive today, such as ostriches of Africa and emus of Australia. Hypsilophodon stood with its body slung quite close to the ground and was well balanced at the hips, with a good build for twisting and turning to escape its enemies. Another aid to sharp maneuvering was its long, powerful tail muscles, which drew the hind legs back into running. All of these features suggest that Hypsilophodon was a speedy little runner. It might have had a way of life a little like some of the very small antelope in Africa today, such as gazelles, which cat delicate shoots and leaves and escape from their attackers by running very fast. When scientists first examined the foot bones of Hypsilophodon, they thought that they were similar to those of perching birds with opposable toes. As a result, Early reconstructions of Hypsilophodon often show it perched up on the branches of a tree. Scientists have rejected this idea, as later studies of the foot bones showed that the toes could not have been used to clamp the feet onto branches so climbing would have been impossible. Iguanodon was one of the first dinosaurs to be discovered and remains were found in England in the 1820s. Scientists first reconstructed the animal as a large, lumbering creature, walking on all fours, with a spike on the end of its nose. But as more skeletons were unearthed, it became clear that Iguanodon was more lightly built than previously thought. However, it still took some time for scientists to agree about how Iguanodon had moved. The next reconstructions featured it standing bolt upright on its hind limbs. The long tail was thought to have acted as a prop to help support the weight of the animal, so this reconstruction made Iguanodon look rather like a giant kangaroo. For a large part of the 1900s, this image remained. Only in the 1980s was it noticed that to keep Iguanodon in an upright pose, the tail would have to be broken halfway along its length. We now know that the tail was held out straight behind the body to provide a type of counterbalance. The backbone is held more horizontally, too. This means that, when it wanted to, Iguanodon could walk on its front and its back legs. The structure of the hand supports this idea. The middle three fingers are strongly built and are capped by hoofs. The chest bones are also heavy and strengthened. But Iguanodon was equally comfortable walking on its back legs alone. The so-called nose spike actually attaches to the end of the thumb. The thumb sticks out from the rest of the hand, and the spike might have made an effective weapon against some predators. Iguanodon was a plant eater, and its jaws and teeth were well adapted for this type of food. There is a broad beak at the front of the jaws for cropping vegetation and many parallel rows of teeth farther back. These teeth formed a broad cutting and grinding surface. When the jaws closed, the upper and lower teeth fitted together, and hinges between bones in the skull allowed the upper jaws to slide sideways as the teeth of the lower jaws slid underneath them. This flexibility enabled Iguanodon to grind up plants thoroughly. It might have had fleshy cheek pouches that caught pieces of chewed food and passed them back to the teeth for further grinding. One of the rarest of the duck-billed dinosaurs, Parasaurolophus was also one of the most advanced of those plant-eating giants. Early ideas about Parasaurolophus had it standing upright, using its crest as a weapon and its tail as a swimming aid. But further research showed that not one of those hypotheses is true. Its most distinctive feature is its crest, which has been the source of most of the confusion among scientists. Many unusual ideas have been put forward as to what it was used for. The crest a huge pipe-like structure extending back from the top of the head to reach over the neck and shoulders was once thought to have been used for battling against rival males in fights for mates. Another suggestion was that it was used as a snorkel in swimming, because hollow tubes within the crest connected to the nasal passages. But there is no hole at the end of the crest. Another idea is that the crest was used in making noises to communicate with other Parasaurolophus. Models have been made of the crest, and, when air is blown through the tubes, it makes a noise rather similar to that of a trombone. For many years, scientists portrayed Parasaurolophus as standing upright on its two hind legs, with its neck held straight up and its heavy tail on the ground helping to support its great weight. 
paleontologists now know that this could not have been so. It seems that Parasaurolophus had a downward bend in its neck just like bison of today. And its huge bones show that, although Parasaurolophus could walk on two legs as well as on all fours, it held its back horizontally, rather than vertically as in the old reconstructions. And its huge tail did not drag along the ground. It was once thought that Parasaurolophus used its powerful tail in swimming, beating it from side to side to push itself through the water. But Parasaurolophus fossils are found in rocks that suggest it lived in a dry, land environment, rather like the habitats in which elephants live today. And the manner in which the bones of the tail are connected to each other shows that they were not capable of making big and powerful sideways movements. It seems that this duck-billed dinosaur did not live and swim in the rivers and lakes of the late Cretaceous period like a gigantic duck after all. It probably lived on dry land, where it fed on the tough plants that were adapted to grow in such conditions. One of the hadrosaurs, or duck-billed dinosaurs, Myasaura possessed the flattened, toothless beak at the front of the snout that characterized this group. It lived and nested along the shores of an ancient sea that stretched across the center of North America during the Cretaceous period. The discovery of large numbers of Myasaura fossils, many of which represent animals at different stages of life, and of their fossilized nesting grounds has enabled scientists to study the family behavior and growth rates of these dinosaurs. Myasaura was first discovered in 1978, when 15 babies and a fossilized nest were uncovered in Montana. These animals were about 3 feet, 1 meter, in length and had been approximately four weeks old when they died. Despite their age, the hip bones and the backbone were not fused together tightly, and the ends of the limbs had not turned completely to bone. This means that they were not able to walk properly. But their teeth were well worn, which suggests they had been feeding on plant matter for some time. Food must have been brought to the nest by the parents, and the babies cared for in the nest for some period of time. Since these early discoveries, many more Myasaura fossils have been found, and scientists have identified distinct growth stages in the life of a developing Myasaura. When newly hatched, the young were just under 20 inches 50 centimeters, long. They remained in the nest for one to two months, and at this stage were growing very fast. They continued to grow rapidly until they were between one and two years old and over 10 feet 3 meters, long. After the age of two, Growth appeared to slow down, and Myasaura reached adulthood at about 7 to 8 years. At this point, they may have been up to 23 feet, 7 meters long. This growth rate is faster than any living reptile and similar to that of living, warm-blooded birds and mammals. This evidence strongly suggests that Myasaura, like other large dinosaurs, were warm-blooded. Some Myasaura fossils are found in bone beds fossil deposits composed of the remains of hundreds of individuals. Some of these cover areas many miles wide. The animals in these bone beds might have died suddenly and been covered by ashes from a nearby volcanic eruption. The large number of skeletons in these bone beds provide strong support for the idea that Myasaura nested in colonies.